you look around, you'll see some old cars traveling the streets of Newport with Donley bumper stickers on them. Hop is well known here in Newport, also throughout Rhode Island, covering the vast expanses of the United States, and his name is known in many countries around the world. Well, the other day, I heard one man with an Irish brogue saying, the name Hop Donley, the third, is better known than Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> and with this, and with that, I'd like to welcome an all-around nice guy, Hop Donley. Thank you, Charlie. Thank Hop, you very much. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thank you. Hop, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, about your family. Uh, what do you remember most about your mother and father? Well, they were both very hard-working people. Um, my father uh, was born in Ireland and came here as a young man. My mother was born in Newport. Uh, she was the uh, daughter of uh, Irish immigrants. And uh, I was the second-born child. I had an older sister, Lorraine. And being like the oldest boy, you know, a lot sort of fell on my shoulders too, you know, kind of helped things out around the house. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the role. But my parents were um, very hardworking, as I said earlier, and very concerned about you know the upbringing of uh, us kids. They were there were nine of us. There were seven boys, two girls. Oh, that was quite it, a family. quite a family, <laughs> is right. You know, and uh, they taught me a lot. I, I learned a lot from um, you know both parents. They each had their own little sayings about things, you know, and sometimes they were kind of uh, contrary, <laughs> you know, to one another, mm -hmm. but the message came across, you know. With nine kids? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. Boy. Uh, tell, I know you had, uh, you mentioned about your brothers and sisters, and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your brothers and sisters. I know that uh, you've got some very talented uh, uh, you've got a very talented family. Yes, yeah, so, um, it's a funny thing that almost all my brothers sing, and I can't sing with a dime. <laughs> my brother Fran, of course, has been in music for years and years and years, and my brother Brian likes to sing, and Chad likes to sing. They all sing, Jackie and, and Don. They all sing you know, very, very well, except me. Uh, uh, I had two sisters, one older and one younger, both who have passed away, oh. and uh, matter of fact, both uh, passed away as a result of cancer. And uh, again, it, you know, being brought up in a big family is, is very, very special. Um, my wife's an only child, and, and she married into all of this. But um, I don't know. I, that must, I, have, must have been quite a transition. Oh, for yes, oh, yes. And then having six children herself and seven grandchildren and three you know, great-grandchildren, it uh, quite, a, quite an experience for her, but she's lived up to it very well. But most of the time, we all got along pretty good, you know, all my brothers and I, and I used to um, sort of mind my younger brothers from time to time just to give my mother a little break because she had twins. Um, I had Franny as a twin, Franny and Brian were twins. Mm -hmm. So I would take my brother Chad, who was two years older than them, out to, you know, get him out of the house to give, give him a break. Uh, so I had a very special closeness to, you know, just all my brothers. and, and uh, uh, we still, you know, every now and then, we'll, everybody will call or we'll get together. And because Jack's um, had his problems with sickness as of late, and we don't yeah, see him. I, I heard he was sick. Yeah, we don't see him quite as much as we'd like to. But when he can make a family gathering, he does. You know, mm -hmm. he's also had a, a cancer problem uh, with his tongue, but he's doing well. You know, thank God. I know your brother Fox. <laughs> Everybody knows the fox. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's quite a guy. Yeah, he is. Uh, he, yeah. Uh, we, had a, we had a talent show down St. Augustine's one time, I don't know if you recall. It was some years back. Yeah. And uh, I guess he and Charlie Byrne sang together. Oh, uh, it yeah. was quite a night. I guess they used to go around singing together quite often. Yeah. So. Uh, how did he even get the name Fox? It's kind of uh, I guess it goes back to his caddy days over at the uh, Newport Country Club. Someone started calling him the Red Fox. He had reddish mm -hmm. you know, hair at the time. And uh, it just picked up, and he's the fox, you know. Wow. And everybody calls him the fox. <laughs> On occasion, I call him Tom, which is his real name. <laughs> and speaking about names, speaking about names, uh, how did you ever get the name Hop Donnelly? Well, when my father came from Ireland, they called um, him a harp. And my uncle Flurry, uh, who was passed away, he was a 
policeman on the Newport Police Department, a motorcycle uh, policeman, and they called him Hop also. There, there was um, so actually, I guess you'd say it was sort of an ethnic slur, but we always felt that the harp is it is the national symbol of Ireland, it's so we don't slur. take it as a slur to be to be called harp. And uh, and I guess um, you know with the, with the name well, first name like Humphrey, although a lot of people do call me Humphrey, um, it's not like a real nickname for it. You know, they call you Hey Humper or something like that. You know, yeah. uh, and it uh, harp sounds very nice and. Um, to a lot of people, I'm Hop. To a lot, I'm Humphrey. And to um, sort of old-time family, uh, I'm Sonny. My father was Sonny. Oh, really? He was big Sonny. I was little Sonny. <laughs> so, and uh, uh, if I run into somebody who is, um, you know, been a long, uh, close member of the family, they will still say Sonny Downey. Yeah. Is there? Uh, let me ask you this, uh, Hop. Is there a Humphrey J. Downey the fourth? Yes, there is. Yeah, my oldest boy. Um, I didn't want to seem conceited and name him after me, so I named him after my father. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. And uh, is this something that's going to go on down the line? Will I, there be a fifth? I, I kind of doubt it. Um, my son and uh, his wife seem very set in their ways, and mm -hmm. who knows? I mean, who knows what's down the road, but I, I wouldn't bet on it. And, uh, you know, years ago you say, oh, she'd be so nice to carry the, the name on the tradition, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden that doesn't... You know, it doesn't mean that much anymore. You know, there are so many other things so important in yeah. life, you know. But, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, but the, the tradition, you know, yeah. carries on. Well, somewhere down the line, somebody could um, name one of their uh, um, children Humphrey. And it could, and it would indeed be the fifth, because that's the way things, you know, fall once you get through the, the fourth. And even if it's a child born, you know, not direct um, from our line. It, it could be. Uh, and it doesn't have different. to be in succession. Either. Exactly, that's, exactly, that's exactly. Right. Yeah. right. That's, that's, what that's, that's what I'm trying to say, but you said it so much better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you, Hop, too. Uh, uh, we all know uh, we followed your life uh, politically, and you were really up there in politics, and you were a hard worker and go getter. I'm uh, uh, just interested to know who was it? Was it your parents that were instrumental in getting you in, into politics, or was there someone else, or one specific person? That so, you? Sort of a combination, Charlie. My father was uh, very, very interested in politics, as was my grandmother. When my grandmother came over from Ireland, she got very, very involved right away with the Democratic Party. That's uh, what most of the Irish did in those days. When they came over, they, they went for the Democratic Party. And um, my father couldn't get all that involved in local politics because he worked for the government. But he's always on the side, you know, always uh, trying to do something for somebody, you know, a candidate that, that uh, he, he thought was worthy of it. Uh, but I was very close to Dan McCarthy, who worked for O'Brien Music, and he also owned the Paddock Cafe. And I guess he was the one that really uh, pushed me um, to run. He was going to get off the council he felt that he had, you know, served his time, and uh, he asked me if I would consider running. And I felt Dan was very close to the working person, and you know, cause he'd be in the bar uh, that he owned, and uh, he was in close contact with every people who come in from all walks of life to see him and talk to him about things mm -hmm. of a political nature. So I felt we were losing something when he decided not to run, and I thought, well, maybe if I ran, I could you know, um, take his place as far as being uh, the, or the working man's representative. And uh, I did indeed become, you know, a blue collar mayor. Uh, they, they always uh, call me that. And, uh, and that's what I tried to be. I tried to stay close to the people. And they knew my every move. I mean, people knew if I was going to go to the star lunch at a certain time, they'd be there, or that I'd be. I used to clean the paddock in the mornings, and they knew that I'd be there at six o'clock in the morning. And people would call or stop by, um, and I enjoyed it. You know, I I loved doing it, and uh, being uh, on the council in Newport and being the mayor is uh, it's rather different than a lot of communities because. One thing, it's the form of government. We have a council manager for a form of government where it's not a strong mayor, but yet the mayor is the chief executive, so to speak, and the signer of all contracts and uh, the greeter of everybody to the city. And where it's such an international city, uh, 
at the time I was in, of course, we had the cup races. So you had people from all over the world coming for the trials and everything else. You have the War College, and you have the international courses with the uh, Foreign Offices of the Staff College and the Command College. So you meet people uh, again uh, from around the world. And where I was in so long, I was on the council 12 years, I was the mayor and chairman 10 years, you know, I met a tremendous amount of people, mm -hmm. tremendous amount of people. Yeah, we're going to get into that in a little okay. while. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is neat. Yeah. That's neat. To bring it back a little bit, though, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, when you were coming up through the, through the schools, uh, what are some of the schools you attended? I went to St. Mary's School uh, up here uh, back at St. Mary's Church, which is no longer there. And um, I went to Dallas Hall Academy for two years. And then I uh, transferred to Rogers for two years, and I graduated from Rogers High in uh, 1948. And that was the extent of my uh, um, school education. I certainly got educated a lot <laughs> the other way. Uh, I know that you uh, uh, do belong or have belonged to a, a lot of organizations. Uh, could you name a few of them for us? Well, I'm county president of the H. Order of Hibernians. I'm uh, going to be installed um, in September as the president of the Newport County ARC, which uh, comes under the umbrella of the Maha Center, mm -hmm. or vice versa, I should say. I'm on the state RIOC. Uh, I'm a, a director at large and a member of the executive board. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Navy League. Uh, I belong to um, the Irish Heritage uh, the organization of the city, the Newport uh, County Irish Heritage. I'm the treasurer of that. And there's a new organization being founded, the uh, Newport Irish uh, Museum, which I'm going to be the treasurer of that. <laughs> I say I'm going to be the treasurer. Actually, it's my wife. <laughs> she has all the books. And I belong oh, to yeah. a lot of other organizations, you know. Busy. Yeah, a lot of other organizations. And I belong to the Elks Lodge and um, like the uh, Newport. Uh, Art Museum and the Newport Historical Society and the President Society, groups like that. Yeah. I, when I uh, retired, I thought that I would get a lot more active in some of these organizations. Mm -hmm. you know, primarily the uh, the ARC and the in the Maha Center and um, uh, the Navy League. But then you know, developed this well, problem. It kind of slows me down a little you bit. You know what yeah. they say? They say how when you retire, you have all kinds of time. Yeah, it, it, it hasn't worked out that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. Um, when Dan, uh, look, I, I just bring you back a little yeah. bit. When Dan Sullivan talked to you about running for Dan office, McCarthy. Dan McCarthy, yep. exactly. Yep. When he first asked you for running for office, uh, what were your thoughts? Were you kind of apprehensive? Yeah, I was. I was apprehensive. Um, it would have been a, a total new thing for me. And I've told the story before about how I did you know, get my papers from City Hall, and I had them signed, and they had to be in at a certain day, and I had them on the visor of my car, and as I was driving up Man Avenue, the wind blew the uh, papers out into the street, and I had to determine then, am I going to get out and get those papers and turn them in, or am I going to forget the whole thing? And I get out and pick the papers up and turn them in down at City Hall. Then you know what they say? They say that your first, your first win uh, when you're running for politics is always your best win. It's something that you come back. It's always it's something you remember. It's it's uh, like that first taste of honey, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you remember uh, who that first person that you ran against and defeated? And uh, uh, what were your feelings? Well, I, I ran at large, so you weren't running against any one particular person. Mm -hmm. You're, um, you know, your name was in a category with six people, and they picked the top three who won. As it turned out, it was Bob Reed, who was on the council, who was a friend of mine. The three at large, um, the other candidates were, were all friends of mine. But I just put my name up, and if the people wanted me, I figured they'd vote for me. But you, you're, you know, you're absolutely right about what you said about the your first victory, because that evening, the, the night of the election, I felt both sides of it because I was up at uh, a little office I had next to the Star Lunch on Broadway, and we were, I had runners that were out in all the voting districts throughout mm -hmm. the city, and they were bringing back the count, you know, of the, what I got in the polls. And um, we added it up, 
and I had lost by oh, no, really? 200 and something votes. Wow. And I said, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? So I figured I, we, I went, in those days, Paul and Eddie's was uh, up next to the stock, you know, on, on Broadway. So when I think, oh, I'll have a beer and I'll decide, you know, oh, should I walk down to the campus and get the party or whatever. And while I was there, a friend of mine came in who had um, got the complete count, and he said, Hop, you, you won. He says, well, you, one of your brothers forgot the count of one of the um, uh, polls. I don't know whether it was Hibernian or whatever, but I ended up winning by 300 and something votes oh, or whatever. Okay. So I knew the feeling, you know. And um, you're right, you never forget that, that first time. And uh, even though there were bigger wins as time went on, you know, and then um, in 79, things kind of went down a little bit in 81. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> Let me ask, talking about politics and talking about wins, and let's talk about uh, what were some of the accomplishments or accomplishments that you and the council, if you can, if you can jog your memory a bit, that yeah. you and the council passed that first time that you were most proud of. It can only be one, or it can be a couple. Well, I will tell you uh, about a um, um, ordinance that uh, I put in that I felt very proud of. And it was something that uh, came about as a result of my paying my taxes uh, a little bit late. I went in before, this is before I, I got elected, and this became a campaign issue. Uh, it's funny, when you start to run, you might not have a whole lot of issues in your mind, but as you talk to people and as you look around the city and see what has to be done, you come up with a lot of issues. Well, I went to pay my taxes at City Hall, and because I missed the deadline for the first quarterly payment, I was not allowed to make any further payments quarterly. My whole tax then became due uh, immediately. That's the way it was in those days. So I said, well, if I get elected, I'm going to do my best to change that. And I did. When I got elected, I changed that. I sponsored the resolution that uh, enacted the change in that. So now if you miss your first quarter, you can pay uh, whenever. And you do get fined for that time. but. Your whole tax does not uh, well, that's good. become. Yeah, you don't lose least, your right. Yeah. You bought it some time. Yeah, yep. and then there was, was there were some good, uh, needs. Well. There were some needs at the beaches. The bathhouses, a couple of them were falling down, and I thought this should be torn down and place cleaned up. And we did that. And a lot of there were so many things that you that you were part of. It's hard to to pick um, specific ones. But during the uh, years that I was in, there was a big fire up on Bellevue Avenue. Remember the Travis block? Mm -hmm. Down there burned to the ground. And uh, they were going to order, issue a demolition order to tear that building down, a very, very historic building. And uh, I got a call from Freddie Williamson, who's in charge. I think he still, to this day, might be in charge of you know, all the historic uh, buildings in the state, and a real, real nice gentleman. And he said, Hop, if, if there's anything you can do to hold back that uh, order, you know, we'd appreciate it. We might have an opportunity to get the owners of the building some uh, low interest money to restore it. And sure enough, I talked to the city manager and we were able to hold back that order and um, the building was restored. And I feel very proud of that. You, you know? should be, yeah. because that, that is a new port yeah. landmark. That yep. was a great thing that you There are a lot of things that happen like that, that, uh, you know, as time goes on, you just do the matter factly, you know, as part of your job. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I, if I would have to sit down and pen some things out, I guess, to say you You know, know people have a tendency yeah. to forget things, yeah. you know, um, or don't remember until they're brought into light again, like you're bringing this into light. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of refreshing to hear these, these things and how hard you worked. Uh, there was a couple of crises, though, in your life, and, and one of them, politically I'm talking about, and one of them was when uh, you heard that the, move, uh, the Navy was moving out of the uh, Navy. Yes, Park. yes, what yes. Was, what was your response to that? Um, it was devastating, Charlie. Uh, I had heard rumors, you know, I had the radio on in my truck, and I worked for Newport Electric, and you hear, you know, that the base is going to close down, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. And I went down to my uncle's cleaners, the Valeteria cleaners on, uh, on Thames Street, and I um, uh, called um, my office to see you know, what, what word they had had, and they said Senator Pell's office was trying to track me down, so I gave the number in. They called me, 
and they told me uh, the words were, everything that floats is leaving wow. Narragansett Bay. And I mean, I was shocked. I was really shocked. I worked very hard to promote good relations between the Navy when I was uh, in office. From the day I, I got in, I always felt the Navy was a priority. They were our biggest employer, you know, and uh, I think the biggest employer in the state, if, if not you know, for the state itself. But uh, I tried to cover as many things as I was, that I was invited to over the graduations and, you know, show goodwill. And, and I was hurt. I, I was really hurt. But um, I felt, well, you have to make a decision. Now, are you going to um, play sour grapes and turn your back on what, what we still had here, all the schools, or do we um, try to look positive and, and forward and try to get more uh, uh, facilities back here of a different nature other than the floating uh, the ships? Mm -hmm. So uh, we did that, and I say we, you know, with the help of uh, Governor Noel at the time, and um, the uh, the three communities got together, and we did. We uh, tried to we tried to bring industry back. We tried to continue the good relations with the Navy. I still went to every graduation that I could go with that I was invited to. I didn't miss very many, mm -hmm. and um, it it worked out fine. You know, I thought it did. They did at, at that time increase the schools. The Office of Candidate School was increased. The um, the NAPS came here. Uh, there are a lot of different schools like that. Uh, now some of them have gone since that time, but um, I I maintained a positive attitude. And uh, as a result, I was given a meritorious public service award from the Chief of Naval Operations in 1976, wow. which I'm tremendously proud of. Wow. And in 1981, I was made an honorary graduate of the Officer Candidate School. Oh, so, you know, that, that was good things to oh, happen. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. I remember at that particular time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that uh, John Pershing Sullivan, remember when Yes, the March on Washington, the that's March right. The March on Washington, yep, yep. he had the, what was it, the SOS? SOS, S Save S Our Ships, that's right, right. yeah. Right. And we, oh, and I went to Washington also with a, a group from Newport. We went down uh, in Ronnie Harmon's car, Ronnie Harmon worked for the city of the Cadillac, and mm -hmm. we went down in Comfort, and we joined that whole group down there and, and did what we had to do, you know. There, there were... Um, no positive results. Uh, you gave it your best shot. Uh, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. You can't ask for anything And more. it was something that you had to do. You had to let your steam off and everything else, you know. It so. must have been tremendously hard, though, you know, knowing that the Navy is uh, leaving, keeping that positive attitude. So you just keep going and, and doing what you have yeah. to do. And, uh, but it worked. It really did, you know. Trait. Yeah. Wonderful trait. Yeah. Uh, I'm going get, to get on to some of this, uh, these other things now. Um, we know, as you spoke of before, that you had the opportunity, being in office so many years, to meet some famous people. So why, could you tell us about some of the famous and some of the not so famous <laughs> people that you've met? Well, I'll tell you about the real famous person I met who I regret that I never had my picture taken with, and that's Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, really? <laughs> he spoke over at the Sharon at L2, the labor group, and I met him there and had quite a nice conversation with him and regret to this day that I didn't have a picture taken with him, you know, just to show my, my kids because, you know, he wasn't around much after now, that. You what, know. what kind of man was he? Was he an intelligent talker? He appeared to be very, yes, he appeared to be very intelligent. Oh, yeah. He very, very proud of, of what they did for the union. I mean, and there were some things that were not quite kosher, so to speak, but uh, yes, he was um, really, really into that union and uh, quite proud of his accomplishments. Yeah. Yeah. But that was one person. And uh, uh, another very uh, interesting man that I met was Johnny Cash. The, Johnny uh, Cash? Yes. No and uh, it was um, it was St. Patrick's Day, 1976, and Johnny Cash had a cousin going to the War College. And he offered to bring his show down to the War College. And uh, I was invited, the President of the War College invited me. And what a what an evening that was! And I had dinner with uh, Johnny Cash and his family over at the Admiral's house after that. That was really nice. Um, now was he a regular type guy? Oh, they that they were so nice. They were so his, really? yeah. He was so nice, down and his earth? family. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised how down to earth a lot of these people are. I mean, they have regular people like you and I, 
and of course you do run into um, one or two that that was a Doris Duke, yeah, on several occasions, and um, she was kind uh, of a st uh, uh, was she kind of a st uh, stay at home. Person? Yes, for the most part, but uh, I had to talk to her about something one time, and uh, I invited her to the office. She came down, and this is when we were doing the. Um, development of Queen Anne Square and uh, I had some questions and I was looking for some support on something and then um, I met her at the festivals, a couple of jazz festivals that she attended. Uh, she she was kind of a, a stay-at-home yes but uh, she w she didn't appear to be a very pretentious person you know she when just like you and I you know talking here that's how we talked uh, with her and uh, I met Elizabeth Taylor. I was at a dinner oh, with her one night. They, yeah. Now, they say about Elizabeth Taylor, I don't know how true it is because yeah. I've never met her yeah. in person, yeah. person or I've never seen her, yeah. but they say that she has the most beautiful eyes of any I woman. think I did look at up look up at them once. <laughs> 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 she did have she did have beautiful eyes. And when I told the kids... That she had a way of uh, capturing yeah. your yes. look. Yes, absolutely. You know? yeah. yeah, she did. She and kind of that yeah. look about her, yeah. Yeah, and I was telling the kids that I met Elizabeth Taylor and had dinner with um, her the night before, and they said, what's so big about her? And I, well, I can tell you a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, of course, um, the royalty uh, that I met, the... Um, My next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that was going to be Queen Elizabeth? That's yes, the, right, Queen Elizabeth. What about uh, Queen Elizabeth? Let me ask you this yeah. question. Yeah. What about Queen, Queen Elizabeth and the... Humphrey Donnelly three story. Could you tell us about that? Well, the story is that when she stepped out of the limousine, she extended her hand and said that I'm Elizabeth II. And I took her hand and said, I'm Humphrey the Third. But that's not true. That was just sort of a joke we made up after. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, and well, then it went all over. It did. It went all over everywhere. It went all over everywhere. And then I told the story after her visit about my father. I said, My father must be rolling in his grave. He was so Irish, he wouldn't let us have English muffins in the no, house, you know. No. And of course, that caught on. And everywhere I went, someone would ask me to tell a story about the English muffins, you know. But uh, that was a, a treat meeting her, no question about it. And she did unveil the uh, the plaque commemorating uh, Queen Anne Square here. And that was there was a whole lot of work that went into her visit. Uh, there was a lot of protocol involved, and uh, I met a lot of nice people. Uh, as a result of that, and I would say specifically the fellow who was ambassador to the United States at the time from Great Britain, a fellow named Sir Peter Ramsbottom, who has passed away since, <clears throat> excuse me, and he later became the governor of Bermuda. And when my wife and I would go to Bermuda, we'd always pay a call on Sir Peter, and he'd invite us up to the government house, you know, and have a nice treat. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been nice being there. Then. Oh, it was. You know, no matter where you went, you know, they would say um, that I'm the mayor of Newport, or somebody would say it, and right away, you know, everybody would look, you know, wow, mayor of Newport. People thinking that you were a multimillionaire for one thing, you know, because you came from Newport, and and of course the name Humphrey J. Donnelly the third, you know, that made him think a little bit, you know. Right? Yeah. But uh, yes, it um, it was a, a real uh, pleasure and an honor to, you know, have represented the city every everywhere. Oh, so many places I went, you know. I went to uh, Japan in 1975 to visit our sister city. Jerry Taylor had a local talk show uh, at the time, and uh, he raised the money. He said, well, let's send our mayor to visit our sister city, and raised over $4,000 by, you know, public contribution, you know, $5 here, 20 bucks, and all that. And they sent my wife and I to visit uh, our, our sister city of Shimoda, and we went to Yakuska and then to Shimoda, and on the way back, we went to uh, Hawaii for a couple of days, San Francisco. It was a, a treat, a real treat. And then um, I went out to uh, out to um, Washington State to talk about uh, tourism and out to Oregon to talk about coastal redevelopment and went down to New London one day to talk about redevelopment also and spoke in Boston on the value of cultural events, you know, for the, for the locals and for the tourists and things like that. Because Newport is so, there's so many things going on here. There's so much to talk about, you know. You know, uh, you had such a, you know, uh, most people don't do a quarter of what you've done in your life. You've, you've done quite a bit. 
I want to talk a little bit more about your white political right yeah. now, if we could. Uh, uh, I, and I know 